Well, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have to say, with the deadline rapidly approaching for this coalition government's first 100 days, we are making good progress. Uh, some 27 of the 49 action points on that list have now been completed, and this week in the House we continue that work. Those areas of work include bills around rebuilding the economy, easing the cost of living, restoring law and order, and delivering better public services. With me today is our Social Development and Employment Minister, Louise Upston, to talk about one of our government's other priority areas. Today we're announcing that Cabinet has agreed on the early actions this government will take to support more people into work and break the shackles of welfare dependency that has trapped far too many people on benefits under the previous government. Minister Upston has written to the Ministry of Social Development, setting out our government's expectations that all benefit sanctions are applied to people who refuse to comply with their obligations to prepare for and look for work. MSD will be required to report back regularly to the government on its use of sanctions so that we can be sure that they are working as part of the tools we need to help move people off welfare and into work. This government inherited a country in decline, and as you heard in my State of the Nation speech yesterday, this will require some hard decisions to repair. But we are also a government that is prepared to make those hard decisions. And it is appalling that the previous government, frankly, let the situation slide to the point where work-ready job seekers are now projected to spend an average of 13 years on a benefit. And that teenagers who go on to welfare will become trapped there for an average of 24 years of their working life. And putting that into perspective, a teenager who becomes trapped on welfare now uh, may not get their first job until they're 40 because of how broken the welfare system has become under Labor. So the cost of this is significant both in terms of the social harm that a life on welfare can have and then also the actual cost of that ongoing support. Current modelling shows young people who spend almost their entire working lives on a main benefit could end up costing the taxpayer nearly a million dollars each in future payments. We cannot and we will not accept that as our future for our young people. The welfare system under this government will continue to support job seekers who can work, into work and make it easier for people to stay on track with their obligations. We will back hard-working people who get up at the crack of dawn to open a corner dairy or to milk cows so they can raise their families and provide them with greater opportunities. And we will back those people who stand up and say they aren't prepared to live life on a benefit and are prepared to put their best foot forward in search of a job. We want to know that we will back them strongly. But there also needs to be consequences for those who knowingly abuse the support that they receive from taxpayers by refusing to do their bit and to deliver on their obligations. And with that, I'll hand over to Minister Upston to make a few more remarks. Thank you, Prime Minister. I'm pleased to announce that we are also taking the first steps towards more regular monitoring and support for people on job seeker benefits. From June, MSD will begin holding work check-ins that people will be required to attend if they've been on the job seeker benefit for six months. MSD will proactively book job seekers into these group check-ins for those who don't already have a dedicated case manager. This is expected to result in an additional 2,500 job seekers each month having a work testable activity to check in on what they have been doing. These will be people who MSD currently has less visibility of in terms of whether they are regularly applying for jobs. These check-ins will make sure job seekers are taking adequate steps to find employment and they are getting the correct support from MSD to help them overcome any challenges they face. This is an early step we are taking towards resetting the welfare system to be more proactive about helping job seekers into work. This will include mandatory reapplication for job seeker support every six months, greater use of community organisations to provide job coaching and other support, proper needs assessments for job seekers to overcome their barriers to employment, a traffic light system that make it, makes it clear what their obligations are, new non-financial sanctions, Action will be taken against those who repeatedly fail to comply with their work obligations. MSD's frontline staff do excellent uh, work in finding job opportunities for people who sometimes have very challenging circumstances. But I believe the previous minister set the tone for a lighter touch to benefit sanctions by saying they needed to be used, and I quote, sparingly and as a last resort. Hmm. I believe this has hindered MSD's efforts to shift some people off welfare and into work. 
Remaining on a benefit has become the rational choice for far too many people, with 70,000 more people now on job seeker support compared to when National left office six years ago. And about 40,000 more people have been receiving this support for a year or more. I don't think it was kind of the last government to abandon beneficiaries to a life of handouts. Nor is it fair on hard-working taxpayers who expect to see their money spent wisely. We know that having a job is the best way for people to lift themselves and their families out of hardship. There is significant evidence that shows employment leads to a better way of life for people in terms of their financial stability, social connectedness, better health outcomes, and greater opportunities for themselves and their children. It is right that our welfare system acts as a safety net for those who need it, but that support comes with certain responsibilities. And with that, I'll pass back to you, Prime Minister. Thanks, Louise. Uh, look, in terms of the House, before we open it up for any questions, uh, this week we've got the third reading of the pseudoephedrine bill. Uh, we've also got the repeal of Section 27 reports, uh, with the funding of that, uh, and also the repeal of the Auckland Regional Fuel Tax. As you know, they are projects that we've signalled very strongly in our 100-day plan. As a consequence, the House will be in urgency on Tuesday and Wednesday. In terms of my movements, I'll be in the House Tuesday and Wednesday. On Thursday, I'll be heading to Christchurch uh, for the 13th anniversary of the Christchurch earthquake, and also to actually thank our first responders dealing recently with the Port Hills uh, fires that we've seen. And I just have to say, having watched that and had regular briefings throughout the course of every day for the last six days, uh, we are, have been incredibly well served by our FENS and our frontline firefighters in particular, uh, and I think they've done an exceptionally good job, so I'm looking forward to spending some time with them. And then on Saturday I'll be at the Blue Greens conference in Paihea. And with that, happy to take your questions. Have you got any figures? To... Have you got any figures about how many people so far are refusing their to comply with their current obligations? You were saying at the beginning that it's a big problem. Yeah. Look, what we know right now is that there's been a 57% increase in the number of people on job seeker benefits. Right? It's gone from it's gone up 70,000 people over the course of the last six years. At the same time, we know there's been about a 58% reduction in actually uh, sanctions being applied, and so the gap between the two is actually pretty profound. All we're saying here is, look, the vast majority of people on 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 job seeker uh, will actually be compliant and actually upholding their obligations to look for work, to train for work, to be, put themselves into a better position for a job. That's for the people that aren't following up on those obligations. We need to make sure that we're following through on that. How many people is that currently? I mean, you've got a target here. What's the what's the number of people that you're talking about? Well, you, I mean, it's really based off, you know, forecasts, and because it hasn't been happening, it's difficult to identify particularly, but what it is is making sure that everybody understands in New Zealand you have a responsibility uh, and you also have rights. And your right is that, yes, you get helped out when you need it, but you have a big responsibility to make sure you're holding up your obligations. I think it will be quite a small amount of people, but as a result, we need to send the message very clearly. The sanctions that already exist in law today are to be enforced. How you do is section numbers of sanctions to Sorry? go back how up much to is, the... How much is this if it is actually based on evidence? Well, we've got great evidence, haven't we? We've just seen a government after six years at record levels of unemployment, um, at record levels of worker shortages, actually increase uh, the, the number of people on job seeker benefit by almost 70,000 people, up 58%. Uh, and we've also seen at the same time sanctions coming down. So we know that there is a, you know, what, what has been happening hasn't been working. Uh, it hasn't been working. What evidence is there that section, sanctions actually work? Um, in 2018, the MSD actually said it's pretty inconclusive as to whether they work and actually um, lesser penalties than New Zealand has could potentially be effective, but harsher ones are not effective. So, yeah, how well, does that let's talk to that. We've got saying. evidence from 2010 yeah. and beyond. So, so the um, MSD uh, evidence from February 2010. Um, draws on some of the OECD evidence as well that actually says the use of sanctions and the threat of sanctions does actually improve work exits. Um, that's what we focused on. We want to see more of those who are currently on the job seeker benefit in work um, and we'll take a number of steps including making sure they meet their obligations to do that. So the 2018 evidence yeah, it doesn't say that, so are you... Well, the 20, so the 2010 evidence uh, does actually say that the use of and the threat of oh, sanctions... Older, older evidence. Yeah, and, and as the Prime Minister said, the current data that we have around job seeker numbers 
and the decline of use of sanctions gives us a pretty let, good steer. Let, let, me give you, let me give you two key numbers that you need to understand, right? How on earth can you be on a job seeker benefit and it's gone from your average time on a job seeker benefit has gone from 10 and a half years to 13 years under, this gov under the last government? On the same hand, you've actually got young people receiving uh, benefit payments who are now languishing on benefits for 24 years on average. That is up over 50% in, a very, in three years, right? So what we've been doing is not working and it comes back to a very simple principle of rights and responsibilities. And all we're saying is, look, the vast majority of beneficiaries are doing a great job, they're holding up their end, they're doing their obligations, but for those that refuse, I'm sorry, we're not going to be apologetic about making uh, sanctions come into play. That, but why so aggressively pursue sanctions now when there's no evidence and we're in a cost of living crisis? Because we don't believe that that kind of attitude that, you know, with all respect that you've expressed is actually acceptable. That actually we're going to consign people to a life languishing on welfare. We're not doing that in this government. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. We're going to do everything we can to make those young people get set up for work. We're going to support them to do that. But actually people who actually are on job seeker benefit, they are deemed by the government to be able to work, can work, should be working on a pathway to work. That's why they're on that benefit. That's not it's, it's, not, it's not supported living, it's not sole parent benefits, it's just purely job seeker benefits. And we have lived in a country that has generated huge, you know, low levels of unemployment and massive worker shortages, and as a result we've, in, we've put 70,000 more people on a benefit. That is utterly, utterly unacceptable. Have you done any modelling as to how many sanctions should be applied under your model? So there was 60,000 in 2017, is that the level that you wanted at? Well, it would be a good start. I mean, what we've seen is a 58% reduction in sanctions over the last six years. At the same time, we've seen a 57% growth in actual number of people on job seeker benefits. So, you know, that's a good place to start. But the message that we need to send back to MSD is to actually say, hey, listen, we want you to be applying the current set of legislation that exists in law today, that the previous government said, hey, listen, back off. It's going to be quite permissive. Let it, let it just go be a bit loose. Uh, we're going to say to you, sorry, actually, we expect those uh, obligations to be upheld. So 50, is a bare minimum of sanctions that you Well, I'm just saying to you, previously we had a situation where you saw um, you know, a, a higher levels of sanction uh, and, you know, being imposed. At the same time, you saw lower levels of people actually on job seeker benefits. Um, what we've seen over the last six years, we've seen a massive spike of people on job seeker. We've seen unemployment trend down. That's not acceptable. And how Sorry, Jane, what? To get that Sorry, let's go to Jane. Given um, those with disabilities and significant impairments currently fall under that job seeker category as well, what sanctions are going to be applied against them? Are you doing some sort of a carve out? How's that going to work? Yeah, so those, um, as you'll be aware, those who are on the job seeker benefit with health condition and disability uh, are deemed to be ready um, for work within a two year period. Uh, they don't have the same um, work obligations. obligations as those who are work ready. Um, their obligations might be to look for a few hours' work. Um, their obligations might be in training or work preparation. But we don't want to wait for the two years before we start to provide the support that they need to get back into employment. Uh, and that's why we will focus on job seekers uh, across the board. But absolutely, there are different obligations uh, for people who have... have um, health conditions and disabilities. There are those with permanent disabilities and there has been examples in the past where they have had sanctions applied against them. So there is presumably going to be some good checks on that not happening, right? So, that, so the regime that we are talking about today uh, is for job seekers uh, and that is our fo focus. We have seen far too many people go on to the job seeker benefit the and they're category. staying for longer. This policy and the re regime and my expectations with MSD is very clear. It is about job seekers. Would you look at separating those? Would you look at separating those two categories back out again, so that the sickness and disability benefit was dealt with in a different system, and all of that focus on the job seeker stuff that you guys want to do could be more targeted to people that can immediately get to work. So, so, let, so let me be clear. There is the supported living payment who have permanent disabilities. This policy is not Nothing about them. This policy is about job seekers and those who are work ready have different obligations to be finding work now. Yeah, also right. people in, in the job seeker, so, so Absolutely. the sickness benefit as well, right? Yes. As well as the no, no, supported no, living. So no, no. The, the job seeker benefit are, are those, was the old unemployment benefit. The sickness benefit is now the supported living payment. They are two separate issues. 
this policy focuses on job seekers, whether they are work ready, that's the primary focus, but for those who have health conditions and disabilities, where they have been deemed to be ready or able to work within a two year time frame, I think it's really important that work and income start mm. working with them now. I don't want to leave them sitting there mm. for another two years and not start and are their steps, but their obligations are different. Mm. Uh, sole parent beneficiaries also have work ready obligations, will this apply to them? This focus is the job seeker benefit. Could you not focus on not sole, sole parent, parent, not supported living, just job seeker. Minister, Minister you've also said that you're concerned of, of the impact on, of sanctions on children. How will you ensure that children won't go without? Yeah, so we're not changing um, the existing sanctions regime in this first step. What we are saying is we want the current graduated uh, sanctions regime to be fully utilised. Um, so that means no change to the 50% reduction if there are children in a household. What we want to see is parents comply when they are given notice that they're at threat of a reduction of their benefit, that they take steps um, to comply, and that means that um, there was no action taken on them. We, we want to see parents in work. It's better for them and better for their kids. How do you see any sanctions to actually increase? What do you want? To change? Is this the use of discretion? So, so what I've said in my expectations to the mm. Chief Executive is that they use the existing regime. Um, so that's the first step. Further down the track, uh, we will be rolling out our traffic light uh, regime, but that will be in the later half um, of this year. And the other part of it, as I mentioned, is these work check-ins to make sure that people that otherwise might not be in much contact with um, work and income are actually fronting up. We know what steps they're taking, uh, and if they're not taking steps, there is action uh, taken to support them, and they're clear about their obligations, and they're clear that there will be consequences if they don't take the necessary steps to be in work. Mr. Minister, can I just say the government introduce a system where a sanction would need to be approved by a second person before applying it to reduce the incorrect use of discretion? Are you guys going to get rid of that? I've made my expectations with the Chief Executive clear that we expect the graduated sanction regime to be fully utilised. Can I just take you back to what you, around Bridie's question, around the reports. Why would you prioritise the research of an OECD report that is 14 years old, that encompasses a bunch of countries rather than MSD research that is specifically about New Zealand and done in a shorter space of time? Your critics might look at that and say you're cherry picking data. Look, if you want, there's two sets of research that give different messages, um, but the statistics, that is the most, the strongest empirical evidence. But how? 70,000 70, more people on the job seeker benefit at the same time that we've seen a 58% reduction in the use of sanctions. That's evidence enough for me to be deeply worried about the number of New Zealanders not in work today uh, that we could be supporting to be uh, a life of greater choice and opportunity about through work. I'm talking yep. specifically. Yeah. Absolutely. It's about uh, principle, about principles, that you have an obligation. It should be about statistics, make... not principles. No, 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 it's about, no, it is about principles, because actually we have an obligation here in New Zealand to make sure that you're holding your end up. Taxpayers are paying your benefits, so they support you at a time when you desperately need it. That's great. That's what we want to make sure is always the case here in New Zealand. We're just making sure that everyone understands their obligation, the equivalent, the equivalent part of that equation is you've got to hold up your responsibility to deliver on your obligations. So just making sure that we are acting and making sure that we are enforcing the current sanction regime that has been in power, been in law for a long period of time, that's not unreasonable. With that, Claire? Claire? Yeah. Sorry, Claire, 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 and they'll come to Katie. Um, Louise, you are also the Minister for Child Poverty Reduction. You have to set new targets, short term and long term. When are you expecting to do that? And will you be looking at whatever advice you get on the impact of the sanctions and the minimum wage increase before you do that? Well, I'm obviously getting a range of um, advice around reducing child poverty. One of the biggest ones is that 60% of children who are in material hardship are in benefit dependent homes. Mm -hmm. That is why I'm absolutely focused on how we support more people into work because it makes an enormous difference for their children. Mm. So, yep, absolutely focused um, on the welfare system and how we ensure it works for families with children because that will assist us 
in achieving our child poverty targets. Are you going to change the Child Poverty Reduction Act or are you going to set the targets as required to and will they be more or less than they currently are? We're on record that we will not be changing the yep. Child Poverty Reduction Act. Um, we, we worked, I personally worked um, with the last government to ensure that we had a piece of legislation that um, the National Party and opposition could support, um, and so that hasn't changed. Has the, has, the, has the government set any expectations with NSD in terms of which sanctions are applied? So that, for example, is it your preference that is, um, benefit is uh, suspended for a short period or something like that? What, what no, we, there's, a, there's a process already that is a graduated regime uh, and, and I've just made it clear to the Chief Executive that the graduated sanction regime that is in place should be utilised. Can, can I just get a bit more want? clarity around the health and disability thing? So, Inside the job seeker support benefit numbers, 109,698 of them were work ready. 80,000 of them are there because of health condition or disability. Mm -hmm. those people still able to work, still deemed to be able to work. So they may be disabled, they may have a health issue, they may have a mental health issue or a challenge, but they are still de deemed able and capable of working. So if someone has cancer and is on the job seeker benefit, will you cut their benefit if they don't turn up to an appointment? <laughs> If, if they, as I said before, if someone is on um, the job seeker health condition and disability, they have different obligations. Uh, and the work and income frontline staff uh, do a fantastic job um, mm -hmm. about recognising what support people need, when and how. And what uh, and, and what conditions, if you like, uh, would be required. Okay. So for someone in that uh, situation, they might have a bit... Um, obligations to be preparing for work. Part-time work. Part-time work, exactly. Ten hours a week. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a wide range, but the main thing is that there are, are obligations to be uh, preparing for work, looking for work, or accepting work. And that is very different based on whatever, uh, you, if you're in the health condition and disability um, category, there are different sets of obligations, but they do Joe, exist. Louise, you've obviously been speaking with your officials about this. I'm just interested, have you uh, spoken with frontline workers about how they have been implementing this, concerns they had about, I guess, implementing it more so, or whether there's benefits to, I guess, having a little bit more of a hands-off approach? What, what has the been? So I've, I've absolutely been getting around um, work and income offices and talking to lots of frontline staff. Um, I have some who's, who have said to me, um, actually, this will help them to support more people into work. This is a tool of a whole suite of tools that we will roll out in government to help um, frontline staff do their job. Um, it at all, and what was the concern about, um, I guess, having to enforce some of this? Was any of that feedback to you? No, but they are they're deeply worried about the number of people on job seeker benefit. They, they go to work each and every day True. to support people to have a better life, uh, and so part of it is to support them into work. Will this require more frontline workers because obviously a lot more meetings is going to be a lot more, um, I guess, regimented in, in how you're rolling this out. Is it going to require a increase to MSD for them to have more staff available? Uh, that's not my expectation. So if you think about the work check-ins, they're done in a group um, environment rather than one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so we, we're deliberately kind of looking at case management is for those who have more complicated circumstances. This sort of check-in provides another option for a job seeker to be in front of MSD mm. uh, and just make sure they're getting the assistance they need. Um, for some of them, it won't be much. Um, for others, it might be quite a bit. And I've seen some of these, uh, some of the activities that work and income do at the front line, and and they're great. Lastly, do you expect that there is, I guess, a group that um, you know will fall through the cracks, um, or is, it, is that not an option for you? Or is there a, a number of people who? just aren't, despite being in the work-ready group, necessarily ever going to fulfil that category? Is there, is there a number you have in mind that that group is? No, I don't. But what I, what I do expect is that uh, when low and, low and middle income workers go to work to fund the welfare system, they have an expectation that those who are receiving the job seeker benefit do their bit. And I don't think anyone would think that that's unreasonable. So all we're doing today is just making it really clear 
there are expectations, there are obligations, and there's a consequence if, if people don't fulfil their end of the bargain. And frankly, it's up to an individual to make sure that they're compliant. And at any point in the process, of the sanctions process, they can get compliant, get back in the system. Yeah. Hey, can we go to Brent and I'll come back to you, Luke. Yep. So, so when do you expect to introduce the broader changes to, to work obligations and sanctions? The traffic light system? Yeah, so work is underway with that at the moment, and this really is phase one, um, and there'll be a number of phases that we need to go through before it's fully rolled out, um, and it may well include legislative change. Um, uh, what's the average amount of time the person's on JobSeeker? Um, well, the average amount of time now for JobSeeker is 13 years, up from 10 and a half years. Um, the average time for someone on a youth payment is actually 24 years. It's up over 50% in three years. You've said a few times today that you know part of the purpose of this is to get people into work. But you've opted for quite a low, historically low minimum wage increase this year, and the first one of the first things your government you turned on was the working for families uh, abatement threshold lift, which was in your tax plan. Are you? Is there anything that you're doing to to improve the working situation for people to? make work more enticing on the other side of this transition? Because it's a lot of stick and no carrot. Well, there is. I mean, we've, we've I think, you know, by repealing FPAs, by actually putting 90-day trials in place, we're actually giving employers every chance possible to actually go out there and take a chance on someone that may have been on long-term welfare dependency and actually give them a chance to take a job and actually make that a much more seamless and a more frictionless process to be able to get into work. That's a good thing. A number of employers I talk to that would love to take on someone, but it comes with risk. Um, and as a result, the 90-day trials is a good way for them being able to do that. When FPAs weaken some of the protections around around workers, making it potentially less enticing for that worker to look for work because it has less of the protections than it, it might have done otherwise. Well, I just disagree. I mean, I think the reality is um, people, we want to support New Zealanders in need. We'll continue to do that. We all understand what that means. We're deeply committed to that as a new government. But what we are also deeply committed to is rights and responsibilities. And it doesn't make sense, and I can't, I can't stand and talk to a lower middle income New Zealander who's paying their taxes, working incredibly hard, and then not to be able to have that money uh, being obligated and being used in the right way with a good return for it. And so that means that we actually need to make sure that people who are receiving their benefits, it's very simple, the vast majority are meeting their obligations. But for those that aren't, we need to be pretty straight up and actually have some pretty straight talk about, about, about them doing so. Can you repeal um, the Māori Health Authority? Uh, will, the, will the operating budget for the authority go back into the centre or will it remain within the health vote and be reallocated to other parts of health? Uh, again, our intention had been to keep it within the health vote and to be able to use it to deploy as we think where there's better ways for us to deliver health outcomes as we've talked about for Māori. Uh, we'll have more to say that, about that very shortly. Uh, sorry, go back to Luke. Was it? Did you have a question? Oh, Katie. Um, another health-related question. Um, so John Ambulance is pulling ambulances off the road uh, to run in costs when staff go on leave or call in sick. Do you think that's acceptable and is there something the government needs to do here to intervene to prevent that from happening? Yeah, look, it's not acceptable. I mean, we want to be in a situation where St John's is available to New Zealanders when they need it. Um, we've, you know, obviously we've had conversations with St John. I remember talking with them in opposition. You know, they don't wish to be fully funded by the government. That would be a bad thing uh, for them uh, and also not great to have a government running uh, such a system like that. Uh, but the combination of good government subsidies and support's been a good thing. Um, I haven't seen the detail of those reports. I'm sure Shane really will look into that further. Okay, but but would you just, go back to Thomas's, just go back to Thomas's previous point around enticement of work and that sort of thing. Alongside setting these expectations, are you also doing work to make sure that people are getting into sustainable jobs or appropriate yeah. jobs, making sure an older person, for example, isn't going into a construction job? Or yeah. Yeah, obviously making sure there's a good match um, and making sure that we can actually keep people in work for longer than 12 months so they actually can stick at it and actually have a pathway forward. How are you measuring that? Sorry? How are you measuring that? Well, that's, that's what we're working with individual people around. I mean, you know, um, we've talked a lot about actually how we support people with job plans and job coaches and young people in particular, getting them work ready uh, so they actually can stick at jobs and stay at jobs. But are you Sorry. considering at, at all decreasing the level at which job seeker is paid? Uh, no, not, not at all. No, that hasn't been a topic of conversation at all. Is the winter energy payment being paid this year? Uh, yes, we're making a commitment that the winter energy payment will stay. Uh, there's no change to that at all. Sorry, ben. Is there a concern that this crackdown comes as the unemployment rate is, is scheduled to rise? Like, is that a concern that there might not be jobs available? And, and 
if there aren't jobs in a person's particular area, I'm thinking particularly regional places, do you expect people to move to get them? Well, we expect people to do everything they can to secure a job. I mean, we've, we've had very low levels of unemployment. I appreciate that forecast to rise uh, because we've had mismanagement of the economy and we've had a huge amount of the economy slowing. No doubt about it. We get that. But to say that we just leave people on welfare irrespective and they don't try and find a job uh, isn't what we're about. Um, we're saying we expect everybody to be trying, doing everything they can to meet their obligations to find work. It's that simple. Prime Minister. Did you feel unsafe at the big out yesterday? Uh, no, not at all. Not at all. It was great to be there again. I was there um, last year. I spent a bit of time talking to the Burnett Foundation. I'm a big fan of what they do around HIV and sexual health. Um, people are free to protest as they wish. Uh, and uh, I thought it was just a bit of a shame that actually, you know, um, that movement uh, actually, or that, that protest, uh, actually overshadowed the good work that was actually happening uh, at the Burnett Foundation. Sorry, Gaza part of the Sorry Ben? Leaving aside the Gaza part of the protest to concentrate on rainbow issues, yes. did, did, did it give you pause to thought um, about this government's policies for trans people? Um, well, what we've said very clearly, as, as you would have heard us say yesterday, we want to continue the support of the previous government's HIV action plan. We think that's a good plan. We'll continue to do that. With respect to trans, you've seen um, a coalition commitment. Uh, it's really about, with respect to sport, uh, to make sure that there's fairness and also uh, inclusion in sporting bodies. Many sporting bodies are handling that tension and, and, and working their way through those issues incredibly well. And at a personal level, I've been very supportive of uh, the trans and, and rainbow community. Yeah, that doesn't is the big one there, which is gender education in school. Well, let's talk about that too. I mean, we're, we're saying there will be sex education in New Zealand schools, and we want parents to do their job as well, um, doing, doing sex education at home. Uh, all we're saying, after being talked to by many parents over the last year and a half, is look, the curriculum has, there was an old curriculum, there's a new curriculum coming, and the intervening period there are guidelines. And there are three problems with it. The first is making sure the content is age appropriate. Parents want to be consulted on the content. And the third thing is we want consistency and no variability in the, in the, in the education. Because because you can, go to a, you can go to an individual school and actually you can have it taught variably by different teachers within the same school because the, no, because the curriculum isn't locked down yet. It's a new, in the transition from old to new. So all we're saying is, no, we want to make sure there's really good sex education across New Zealand schools. We just want to make sure that its parents are consulted, it's age appropriate, and importantly, that it's consistently taught. What about, what about sexuality education? Not just sex education, but sexuality. I'm sure there will be a component of it. Because they, now they are different in the curriculum. No, no, I understand, but I'm sure it'll be a component of it. Yep. And I just have some questions about the uh, changes of agencies, the uh, changes of the names. Do you know when uh, the agencies will be expected to have their English name first? Uh, look, no, it hasn't been a big focus for us in our first 100 days. Well, Minister, do you know how much... Do you know... Are you concerned that agencies might be wasting money? in regards to transitioning to their English name first? Um, look, I'm, I'm aware some agencies have done it already proactively off their own back, and it's actually been very cheap and reasonable. It's a simple of just taking the old JPEG that used to have the priority or the you know, um, English English um, above, the, of the, above the tareo and others have flipped it around. It's pretty simple and easy. For example, right, though, for example, though, going out and buying new high-vis jackets, which are unbranded because they don't have the... Um, Te Reo Māori name on them, would that be a waste of money to you? I've got no idea what you're talking about. Prime Minister, would that be a waste of money? Well, I don't know the situation that you're talking about. What, what, are, you, what are you referencing? If an agency goes out and buys um, unbranded high-vis jackets for a Prime Minister and his entourage, for would me? that be a waste of... Yeah, would that be a waste of money? Um, I would have thought so, but I, I go to a venue, I get out of a car, I get given PPE, and I go look at a project, so I'm not quite sure what you're getting at. You know, but that it had been a direction from a minister to change a name of the agency and then to go out... Sorry, I'm, not, I'm really struggling to understand what you're talking about. <laughs> Can you ask the question? Can you say it again? So, I guess, that's just an agency fulfilling the direction of a minister who's told them to change their name. So they go out and buy new, unbranded, protective equipment. Uh, well, I'm not aware of that, so I can't, can't comment on that. Are you worried that agencies are wasting money to... Uh, to I don't think they are. I, as I said, we haven't, we haven't gone through a programme of talking about that. Many agencies have proactively gone about doing it. It doesn't come at huge cost. It's quite simple to just change the brand and flip it around. We've got old JPEG files, we've got new JPEG files. That's how many of them have done it so quickly. Uh, but it's not a priority for right now. Have you, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Prime Minister, okay. have you spoken to the Foreign Minister about the government's response to Alexei Navalny's death? You said yesterday that you'd be having 
to the conversation? Yeah, we, we, we speak uh, regularly. We spoke again last night about it. Um, and again, um, what we're saying very clearly there is that, you know, it's an unacceptable situation. Uh, ultimately, Putin and is, is accountable for it. Um, and uh, MFAT officials will be talking very strongly and conveying that position to the ambassador. Will the New Zealand government be imposing any consequences? Will there be any further action taken? Well, again, you know, we're, we're up for any independent type review, but for our, from our perspective, it's you know clear to us that who is accountable, uh, and there will be any, you know, further sanctions or anything like that on the table in response to that. Uh, may well be, but we'll, we'll have a look at that. I mean, at the moment, MFAT uh, senior officials at MFAT will talk to the ambassador and raise and convey our concerns there. Sorry, yes. Yesterday, in your State of the Nation speech, you talked a lot about how there's been a lot of surprises in the books and things are worse than first thought. Yeah. Are you managing expectations in any way about how quickly you're going to be able to deliver certain targets? No, not at all. What I'm just trying to do is I just think that New Zealanders need to have a growing up conversation and that the Prime Minister should be able to say really up front and really straight up, hey, look, these are the challenges that we've got. This is the situation we've inherited. This is the mess that we've got uh, left behind by the previous government. Let's face up to the brutal facts of our reality, whether we like to hear it or not and then let's put a plan together to actually get ourselves to a much better place. And that's all that I was doing yesterday, was saying to the New Zealand people, hey, listen, you want me to level up, talk straight to you about the actual challenges that we've got uh, in front of us, whether it's been in education, whether it's been in health and housing and infrastructure and crime and in the economy. Uh, but we are determined as a government to keep moving through and actually ploughing through and getting things done for them. That's what this has been about today. You know, it's, again, another practical response to a challenge that we've got, which is we cannot have 70,000 people on welfare more at times of low unemployment and record job vacancies. Just on that, um, you are 81 days into your 100 day plan. Yep. You've got 22 by our count policies that you still need to get across the line. Policies, legislation, mixed bag, say what you will. Can you actually do this? That's not a lot of time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I, I get once or twice a week a full review of all 49 actions, the progress that's being made, whether it's on track, off track, uh, head of head of program. Uh, and now what it is is just about us making sure we get our legislative program out in the sitting block that remains, uh, and we're very confident we can do that. So you can categorically say, hand on heart, that at the end of this 100 days, you will unambiguously tipped off all 49 options. Correct. What do you envision to be the toughest part of that? Will it be the gang area? Like from the stuff that's left? Um, look, we've got work to keep going through, but in fairness, we've been talking about the programs that are still coming you know, over the last you know, four, four, eight weeks or so. Um, and obviously there's legislation being drafted and, and so that it's ready to go to the House. Um, but look, there's been, you know, we've got some big things that we're taking on. You know, fast track consenting is a pretty big one. You know, We've knocked off the RMA before Christmas. We want to make sure we supercharge fast track consenting so we can get things built in this country. And then our third phase is before the end of the term, come back and we look at RMA reform. Um, yes, we've, we're working through our law and order package right now, which is around the commitments we made around gangs and, uh, and law and order commitments in general. Uh, we'll continue to do that. Uh, we've got a few other things that we've got to work our way through. But um, by and large, as I said, we have a 100-day committee. Um, I chair it. Uh, I get an update uh, regularly, at least twice a week, uh, on how those actions are going. Um, I'm in constant dialogue and conversation with our ministers. We have a series of meetings and mechanisms to see how that's all going. Uh, this afternoon, I'm meeting with three ministers about their expectations that I have of them for the coming year with their CEs uh, there as well, this uh, chief executives of their departments. So we're all very aligned about what we're here to do and, and what we've got to get done. Um, you've, been, you've talked about taking the 100 days of um, idea into the future. Will you get that committee? Um, the 100 day committee? Uh, no, what it will morph into is what we call the strategy committee. So initially how we set it up was that we would have a cabinet. We had a cabinet business committee and we had a 100 day committee. And that was because we wanted to get moving very, very quickly. Uh, over the last couple of weeks we've got our cabinet, full cabinet committee structure in place, which is uh, more normally how things are delivered. Uh, and that's been working well um, and that's been going for the last couple of weeks. And so what I'll do is that on March the 8th I'll actually stop the 100 day committee. I will chair then the strategy committee, which will actually be a big focus on delivery and getting things done. And so the work of the 100-day committee gets transferred into that, into the strategy committee. A number of our police stations are riddled with mould and rot. Are you concerned about the state of them and will you be doing anything? Well, look, I mean, I think what we've discovered is that we've got challenges across um, property portfolios, whether you look at the courts, whether you look at police stations, whether you look at um, uh, school buildings. Uh, we know that there are real challenges and there's massive infrastructure deficit and those are the issues that we're trying to wrestle with and work our way through and so we'll continue to do that.
So will you make any commitment to fix up the police station? Uh, well, we're, we're making a commitment to work through a whole bunch of infrastructure deficit that we have across this country, whether it's on roads, whether it's in school buildings, as I said, whether it's in hospitals, whether it's in police departments, or whether it's in courts. Uh, we know that there are real challenges across the whole portfolio of government buildings, um, but we need to make sure we've got a good assessment, and then we've got to find a way fiscally that we can make those investments to improve those situations. Was it, was, was it appropriate for your Minister Shane Jones to say that he was uh, horrified by a, a recent Supreme Court ruling and uh, to say that the courts have been Americanized? Um, I don't have any issues with that. Uh, I've spoken with Shane. I, he and, and our officers talk regularly. Uh, what I can say is that um, he's well aware of his cabinet obligations, and importantly, uh, I think he's doing a great job. He's advocating very strongly for uh, business sectors that we want to see growing in this country, uh, and he's he's a, he's a he's a proud advocate for those sectors, and he should be. And that's what I expect him to do because you know this is a country that's that's declined. Our economy has shrunk three of the last four quarters. We do not have the luxury of turning off growth, and so the same way he's been advocating for his portfolios and the sectors that he, he, he is, is charged with through his portfolios. That's why you know, Todd McClay and I met, for example, at Premier House last week with, for a whole day with you know, folk from Tohono, which is actually about innovation in the agriculture sector or the primary industry sector. So you know, we want to see growth in each of our sectors. That's why we're spending a lot of time with that commu those communities. Uh, and I think he's doing his job well, advocating strongly for them. The comments weren't specific. You know, it wasn't about promoting industry. It was about crit criticising the Supreme Court. Do you have concerns? When your ministers are well, no, I think he understands his obligations as a minister, and I think what he's got to focus on is the effectiveness of the law rather than individual cases, and I, and I get, he understands that. Did you, did you remind him of the cabinet obligations following the report? Oh, I'm comments? sure my office had a chat about it, but um, the bottom line is I'm pretty relaxed about it. You're pretty relaxed about it. Why did they remind him? Oh no, no. Let's be very clear. There, that's a very different situation when you've got a minister that's actually reaching out to a police commissioner, advocating for a particular case, or leaking cabinet documents out to donors. So let's be really clear. They are, that is apples and oranges. Judiciary. Sorry. Also, you went him for criticising the judiciary. Well, I say the Stuart Nash situation is completely different, and as to why he uh, was, you know, should and, and was rightfully kicked out of cabinet. Quite right. Yeah. Stand by all of the comments that you made about Stuart Nash when you were criticising him over criticising the judiciary now? Well, I'd just say to you, you know, when you've actually got criticising the judiciary and calling the police commissioner to advocate for a case coupled with uh, actually sharing cabinet papers with donors, a uh, different gravity of situation. Did you see um, testimony from news organisations on the Fair Digital News Bargaining Bill and are you positively disposed to getting giants like Meta and Facebook, oh, sorry, Meta and Google to pay for advertising to <coughs> Yeah, again, um, I, I, haven't, I haven't followed uh, the submissions that I know are going on right now. Um, in fairness, that's up to Melissa Lee as our Broadcasting Minister to digest and work out where we go forward from that. Um, you know, I think you know, in opposition we had a clearly stated position, which was that we fundamentally felt uh, we don't want to see any of those actions, as we saw take place in Canada, that ended up actually uh, narrowing the plurality of media voices, uh, for example, with small regional players that end up being impacted heavily by legislation like that. So, in fairness, Melissa Lee and as the Minister needs time to digest all of that. And we'll, we'll, hear, we'll hear the submissions out uh, and see where things get to. Do you agree, though, that there is a problem and, and that, you know, Kiwi businesses are missing out on revenue that they could have from multinational giants? Plucky. Well, I'll just say to you, I think many media outlets, if they're smart, and many of them have been, uh, they go do their own commercial deals with those uh, with the tech platforms. Would you um, consider a humanitarian visa for Palestinians, um, which allows them to work and to access healthcare? Yeah, look, I mean, that's something that I know Erica Stanford's um, considering, uh, as she talked about on Sunday morning, and so um, we'll, we'll see where that advice goes to. Prime Minister, what's yesterday. The, um, ceasefire? Um, people, what's the latest with for a ceasefire, and is the committee expect any other? action in this space? Well, I mean, last week um, I actually initiated and coordinated the response from uh, the Australian Prime Minister, the Canadian Prime Minister and myself to come together. Uh, we did a, you know, we put a statement together uh, within 24 hours, uh, which was to say, you know, our position on Rafah, for example, which was that we do not want uh, Israel to enter into Rafah. Uh, we don't think that's appropriate. It's going to cause massive civilian pain and suffering. Uh, and that's something that I think I think we're very proud about. You initiated um, we, that response? Uh, yes, yes, we did, yeah. And, um, and the reason was to make sure that we 
could actually get, again, we had worked together as a CANS group, as we call it, um, before, as you knew, when we called for a humanitarian ceasefire. Um, and we wanted to make sure we sent a very strong signal to Israel in particular that we do not want them in, in Rafa, obviously. What other countries did you reach out to to be part of that response? Was it um, just those two? It's, it's those two. I mean, I've spoken to Prime Minister Trudeau um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, obviously, I've spoken to Anthony Albanese um, several times as well. And, um, you know, those are like-minded countries of New Zealand. And so when we when we have common interests, uh, we have strong values that we want to stand up for, uh, I think there's some real value in us doing that as a, as a threesome um, that actually have countries that are very aligned in, in our perspectives on these things. Did you ask other Five Eyes partners in UK? Uh, no, I think we just, I just worked with the two that I previously worked with. Yep. Okay, thanks so much team, appreciate your time. Have a great week.